Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Abdulaziz Saud. Medic, I'm a medical intern from Saudi Arabia. I'm a member of uh, Surgery Q8. Uh, welcome back to our new session of uh, Surgery Q8, of, uh, Surgical uh, six, uh, Series, Fixed Series. And uh, today's uh, session will be about the surgical management of the Crohn's of Small Bowel. Uh, this session will be given by uh, Dr. Hamid uh, Aladoui. Uh, our guest is, is from Oman. Uh, he completed his uh, residency and fellowship from uh, University of uh, British Columbia. And uh, he is uh, currently working as a colorectal surgeon at uh, Kavos Hospital. Uh, welcome, Dr. Hamid. Uh, before uh, we start our session, uh, I will remind the audience, if you have any question, please share it uh, in the Q&A. Uh, Dr. Hamid, uh, the, the mic is yours. Um, thank you, Abdelaziz. Um, and um, thank you so much, um, Sir Q8 and the Kuwaiti board for the invitation. Um, it gives me a great honor to be here with you. And um, uh, we're gonna be talking about uh, Crohn's disease of the small bowel, and mainly on the surgical management of Crohn's disease. <clears throat> um, so um, I have no uh, disclosure uh, to give, and um, these are the objectives we're going to talk about uh, tonight. Um, I would start uh, my presentation with the uh, boring book knowledge. And then we're gonna talk about the actual uh, surgical management um, later on in the presentation. Um, uh, these are three celebrities. I don't know if you recognize any one of them. Um, the first one to the right is uh, Pres President Eisenhower. Um, he is the uh, president of the United States during the Second World War. And he's basically the mastermind of the D-Day um, or the uh, Battle of Normandy, which basically turned the uh, uh, Second World War uh, upside down. Um, the second one um, in here is um, Larry Nice. He is uh, um, an, uh, a Lakers player in the NBA, and he's a very successful um, athlete. And the last one to the left in here is uh, Pete Davidson. Um, he is an um, uh, American uh, TV host and uh, Hollywood uh, superstar. Um, what's common for these people um, is uh, that all of them are diagnosed with Crohn's disease and um, all of them um, have uh, run a very successful life with a very good achievement and, uh, you know, history to remember. Um, um, and I think all of us as a, a resident and as a trainees and a, as a surgeons and doctor in general, um, we have to change that um, uh, picture of Crohn's disease where everybody think that it's like um, a chronic uh, disease that can impact your life and would uh, impact your quality of life too. Um, these uh, people have made it so any Crohn's patient can also make it. Um, I thought I would start um, my presentation with a common theme, uh, which is uh, COVID. Um, everybody's talking about COVID nowadays, and specifically vaccination for IBD patients. I get many questions uh, from my patients and friends about this. Uh, so vaccination is actually recommended for IBD patients, um, regardless whether they are on biologics, steroids, um, we know uh, that combination therapy uh, can increase the risk for severe COVID, uh, but one single biologic does not appear to increase that risk at all. Um, any vaccine uh, for IBD patients uh, on biologic can be used except live vaccine, which is um, Johnson & Johnson, uh, the only one. <clears throat> Um, just talking about Crohn's disease in general, um, uh, Crohn's disease uh, as a definition, it's um, chronic uh, transmuter uh, inflammatory uh, disease. 
and the whole um, uh, uh, the whole um, um, landmark of the disease it's relapsing and remitting disease meaning that the patient would have um, um, a period of um, uh, disease free and then would have a symptomatic recurrence at some point um, the incidence of Crohn's disease globally is around 100 to 300,000, uh, sorry, 100 to 300 in 100,000 uh, individuals. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have much data about the incidence in the Middle East. Um, however, um, uh, this is a Saudi uh, uh, statistics. It's a bit old, but what we can see, um, and that's also my observation here on Oman, uh, we have an increased trend uh, of Crohn's uh, disease and slightly increased trend in ulcerative colitis too. Uh, but overall, we know any patient for all comers, 80% um, of Crohn's patients would require um, surgery at some point in their life. Um, 40 uh, to 55 would require that surgery in the first 10 years of the diagnosis, and one third. Uh, would require the second operation again within 10 years. Um, the trend of Crohn's disease and the need for surgery and symptoms has changed significantly, uh, mainly in the uh, 50s by the invention and introduction of steroids, and also by the introduction of the biologics in the 90s. Um, the uh, steroids and biologics delay patient symptoms and delay surgery. But the moment they develop complication, um, they fail their management, uh, their medical management, and they would need surgery. Uh, I'm not going to go in details about the etiology uh, of Crohn's disease because it's unknown. Um, there is different theories, but we know that it's a combination uh, between host, gut, and environmental factors that would lead to mucosal inflammation. The most accepted um, theory is um, uh, a genetically susceptible patient uh, with environmental impact um, that would lead to the inflammation. And we know it's also running the family and there is some genetic factors to it. Um, I would run uh, in this slide really quick and I would pick up on the most important stuff. Um, so everybody talks about the microscopic feature, macroscopic features. Um, the gross uh, features of the of the uh, uh, Crohn's disease. Um, when you look at the at the bowel, basically uh, the main uh, thing you would see on the uh, Crohn's disease is um, uh, a fat creeping. Uh, when you look at the bowel, the fat would be robbing robbing the inflammation and trying to contain the inflammation. And um, um, you would see also a stretching disease uh, and narrowing in the, in the lumen of the bowel. Um, as um, we might know, um, that Crohn's disease affects the entire alimentary system from, the, uh, from mouth to the anus. And it also has a skip lesion. Um, you most commonly see uh, Crohn's disease in the terminal ileum. Um, and also associated with perianal disease uh, in terms of perianal fistulas and abscess. These are the microscopic features, and um, I'm not going to run through them um, because uh, to me, they are hard to memorize. Um, so uh, um, I would just mention uh, the whole landmark of uh, microscopic diagnosis of Crohn's disease is uh, mucosal inflammation uh, that's affected whole layer of the bowel, and you would see uh, granulomas. Um, there is uh, different classifications uh, for uh, Crohn's disease. Um, they just provide uh, a common universal language, but they, does, uh, they don't impact any uh, management uh, decisions um, or diagnostic uh, 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 guidelines. The uh, most common two is Vienna and Montreal. Basically, I'm not going to go into details on this too, but the, the Montreal classification is just a revision of the Vienna classification. However, I would focus on the disease behavior because it's important. 
there is um, uh, two main behavior for Crohn's disease that would come up, would come later on in the presentation a few times. Um, the uh, first behavior is stretching disease, where you have stretchers commonly in the terminal ileum, and the second uh, behavior is penetrating disease, meaning you have fistulas. Um, you would see these sometimes when you have a referral from gastroenterology. And again, they just provide a common universal language for everybody to understand what's going on with the patient. Uh, these are the general uh, uh, indication to operate on Crohn's patient. There is emergent and non-emergent. Uh, for the small bowel, uh, the emergent uh, indication is um, holovix fiscus perforation. Um, when you have free air and uh, massive uh, bleeding. These are the two um, emergent uh, indication. And for the colon, it's uh, toxic colon or toxic colitis. For the non-emergent, uh, meaning the elective indication is a uh, stretcher, uh, fistula uh, or abscess, cancer or uh, growth delay in children. Okay, that was painful. That was uh, the uh, uh, most boring part of my presentation. Um, um, now we're gonna come to the interesting part of the, I hope it's the interesting part of the presentation. And I'm gonna play, play a video uh, to start with. Um, so uh, that's the video. I don't know if you've uh, seen that sport before. It's the wing uh, uh, suit um, jump. Um, it's probably the most risky sport you would ever um, see um, or encounter. And basically that's me uh, and how I feel when I operate on, uh, on Crohn's patient. <laughs> the whole message uh, behind the, uh, uh, the video is um, these guys are experts. And they make it look uh, simple and easy, but actually before they jump, um, they take days and days of planning their bath and they actually draw the bath. They have a virtual uh, uh, sort of tour on the bath and um, they plan every single step, every single move um, for, their, uh, for their jump. 
and you can you can see they come really really close uh, to the trees and rocks um, and a single small mistake can lead to a catastrophe and i think that's a really good um, um, a way of thinking about how to uh, plan and operate on Crohn's patient. I hope that video sticks to your mind whenever you see a Crohn's patient. Okay, now to the, um, um, uh, uh, hopefully the interesting part of the presentation. So whenever I see a Crohn's patient, um, I have a different dimension to think about. Um, I have three circles and two boxes. Um, I look at the patient's stability. If the patient is stable, um, I have the whole time in the world to plan their course in the hospital and to plan their surgery. If the patient is not stable, that's easy. Um, if their vitals are not normal, if they are hypotensive, if they are in shock, if they have peritonitis, it's easy. Just take them to the operating room and do whatever you have to do. Make sure you resect the disease part and don't put them back, back together. Don't do an anastomosis. Just um, divert them with a stoma. The other circle is the location of the disease. And that would determine which operation I would do for this patient. Patient with proximate disease has different operations. Patient with distant disease in the small bowel has different uh, procedures. And that would also help me to understand their uh, 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 disease behavior later on, because proximal disease carry worse prognosis and they have more recurrence than the distal disease. And then I look at the overall status of the patient. And in the status, I focus on two main things, the patient medication and mainly steroids. If they are on steroids, they are in trouble and you are in trouble as a surgeon because your options are very limited on what you can do. And the other thing which is often forgotten is the patient nutrition. Um, is the patient nutritionally behind or they are optimized? If they are behind, they are going to run in trouble and you don't want to operate on them and do a definitive surgery if they are not nutritionally optimized. Um, and you have to optimize them. I would come to the nutrition later on and you will talk in, into the details about it. But personally, I would not never touch a um, a Crohn's patient and do a definitive surgery if their albumin is, is less than 30. And um, in these circles, um, I would always look at the disease phenotype, phenotype, meaning if they have a stretching disease, usually that's an easy fix. If they have a penetrating disease, it depends on the extent of their penetrating disease. Um, and um, that would also dictate their management. And it would come later on to discuss um, uh, this in the future slides. <clears throat> but always, always remember, whenever you deal with Crohn patient, Crohn's patients, you're not alone. Approach Crohn's patient as a multidisciplinary um, care. Um, you as a surgeon should lead the team of gastroenterology, a nutritionist, pharmacist, and most importantly, the patient themselves um, in their care. Always get help. Um, uh, don't, uh, don't operate on any patient without talking to their gastroenterology because most of the time you would meet them for the first time, but the GI docs has been with them for ages and they actually trust them more than they trust anybody else. <clears throat> and again, um, these are just general principles. We'll come to the details later on. As a general rule, if you're dealing with Crohn's inflammation in the small bowel, just inflammation, that's not your problem. That's the GI problem. They need to put them on medication, um, uh, whether that medication is steroids or biologic. You don't need to operate on them at all. You operate on Crohn's complications. If they have complications, mainly stretchers or fistulas, there is no biologic or steroids on earth would fix that. And they would need an operation to resect that segment. This is as a general rule. <clears throat> Um, always, always get a pathology on Crohn's patients. Don't trust imaging. Don't trust like anybody. You have to get a tissue diagnosis uh, of their disease if you can. And then after you establish their diagnosis, before you operate on them, you have to draw a roadmap. And you have two roadmaps you have to draw, a physiological roadmap and anatomical roadmap. The physiological roadmap is easy, is their labs, 
and their nutrition. Just look at their labs, make sure they are not septic and, and um, optimize their nutrition. The anatomical roadmap is even easier. You need to um, establish the extent of their disease and you have only um, three tests you can do to establish um, their Crohn's disease anatomy. Um, scopes, upper GI endoscopy, lower GI endoscopy, and imaging. And imaging, you have only two modalities you can use. Um, everybody um, would get a CT scan, a plain CAT scan with IV and oral contrast, but that would not help you in deciding their disease extent. What would help you is two things, either a CTE, a CT enterography, or an MRI enterography. So make sure you have a physiological map, you have an anatomical map before you touch and operate on any Crohn's patient. <clears throat> These are general rules. I put some of them in, uh, in Arabic because they are very, very important. Every time you see a patient, Crohn's patient resists to operate. Power, don't touch, touch them because most of the mistake happens when people rush into operating on them. No, like not, I wouldn't say not, but like uh, I wouldn't say nobody, but like, it's very, very unlikely for a patient to die from Crohn's inflammation. So just resist to take them right away in the, uh, to the operating room. You have all the whole time in the world to work them up, get the map, the physiological map, the anatomical map, make sure they are optimized um, before you uh, go to the operating room. Don't be smart. It's easy. Don't invent any operating operations, don't invent any test, um, um, just stick to the basics, get the roadmap, optimize them. And as I much as I hate backseat driving, it's the most annoying thing to me, but you have to be a, you have to be a backseat driver when you are managing Crohn's patient. Just tell people what to do and don't do anything. <clears throat> um, these three aspects are um, forgotten um, sometimes, um, always, always address abscess, uh, sorry, sepsis. Sepsis is the leading cause of mortality in Crohn's patients. If you have any abscess, clean the abscess. If they are bacteremic, deal with the bacteremia. Deal with the sepsis first. <clears throat> Don't ignore DVTs. Um, these patients are on an active inflammatory state. Um, they are hypercoagulables and uh, they can form DVTs uh, more than anybody else. So put them on DVT prophylaxis when you see them. And then focus on their nutrition. You assess the nutrition with many aspects. Um, you can assess their diet by history, weight loss by history. You can assess nutrition clinically, looking at them. Um, if they have muscle wasting, um, and the whole like malabsorption uh, list that you would see in any textbook. And um, the, um, do a biological, uh, sorry, a biochemical assessment of their nutrition using two things, their albumin, but remember all the time, albumin is an acute phase reactant. It can be falsely high um, in Crohn's patients, especially when they are on um, acute inflammation. Um, uh, try to get the pre-albumin if you have it in the center. It would be the best uh, test to assess the nutrition. <clears throat> um, when you go to the operating room, regardless what you're dealing with, start with the proscopy. Uh, put the camera in and see what you're dealing with. Uh, but uh, don't persist if you think you cannot do it laparoscopically. If you have a big phlegmon, big inflammatory mass, there is no point of persisting. You're gonna end up making a big incision to that, to take that inflammatory mass out. So just convert early to laparotomy, but always, always start with laparoscopy if you can. Go to the operating room with two plans, plan A and plan B. Plan A is to resect the complicated segment and put them back together. Plan B is always a bailout option. And your bailout option is very, very easy. If you can't do the operation safely, just bail out, divert them approximately. 
give them a proximal stoma and leave. Diversion would heal the distal segment, even without biologics. <clears throat> so uh, we're gonna do some cases. Um, I thought I would pick up uh, uh, someone from the uh, uh, attend uh, from the participants or the attendees, uh, but um, I remember being a resident uh, not long time ago, and that was the most annoying thing. Uh, that happened to me when the attending and the consultant picks on me. I hate it. So um, I'm not going to do it to anybody, uh, but I'm going to run on the uh, run the cases uh, uh, web slides. So case one is a 27 years old uh, medical student. Of course, it has to be a medical student. Uh, they presented with weight loss, chronic diarrhea, and uh, occasional bleeding. Um, and they have a family history of, uh, of um, Crohn's disease. Um, their exam is not impressive. Their vitals are normal and their abdomen is distended. And that's all what you get in their, uh, in their history. That's what they tell you. Um, so um, of course, someone uh, thought to do labs on them and um, imaging as well. Uh, so their labs are um, a white count is normal. Their hemoglobin is low. Um, uh, their keratin is a bit high and um, their um, uh, calcium is low and their albumin is low. And this is their um, uh, uh, X-ray. Uh, just take a minute to, to look at the X-ray and um, uh, have an answer in your head. Um, uh, and I'm gonna tell you what's the, what's the finding. <clears throat> so as you can see on the X-ray, I'm not gonna go to the basics of like describing the x-ray, but I would tell you the diagnosis. So they have massively distended um, uh, stomach and they have um, uh, uh, what we call it a huge um, uh, air fluid level. <clears throat> so of course this patient uh, would get um, CAT scan and this is their uh, CAT scan. Um, and when you went to see the patient again, they told you that they are having uh, uh, vomiting uh, for a um, few months now, and um, they, uh, they can't keep anything uh, basically down. So uh, what you can see in here, um, I would give you a minute just to look at the CT scan. And by the way, these are like uh, a real patients that I've seen uh, during my uh, training or my practice, but the images are not uh, their, uh, their images. So you can see you did the distended um, stomach and um, you can see collapse small bowel and collapse colon. Um, when you see this sign, it's a famous sign in the, uh, in the textbook. I'm not gonna tell you, uh, you can look it up. Um, this is indicative of um, uh, gastric output obstruction basically. So just think about what you wanna do next. And um, this is what um, I would do next. So I would resuscitate that patient, um, give them IV fluid um, as much as, um, as they need. Um, and then um, uh, put an NG tube down. Um, and you know that they are nutritionally depleted because uh, they are losing weight and their albumin is low. So just see the projection of their diagnosis and disease. I'm not saying you should start them on any form of feeding, but keep that in your mind at all. And also keep in the back of your mind that this patient might go septic at some point. So have a plan in your head. Um, so um, someone decided to scope them. And this is what you can see uh, in the junction of D1, D2. Basically there is a tight uh, stretcher in the, um, in the um, area. Um, and um, there is like a small pin, uh, pinpoint opening um, at, the, uh, at the D2. Um, so I wish we have someone uh, to be grilled uh, uh, in, the, in the case, but I would go to the next slide and we'll tell you uh, what happened. So they took a biopsy uh, from the area and uh, it shows uh, uh, foci of 
pillus blunting, glandular destruction, mixed chronic inflammatory infiltrate in the lamina propria. Um, whenever I look at the pathology report, I always think the pathologists are the smartest uh, 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 physicians because I don't understand anything at all. And uh, from the pathology report, I always look at the features at the important features and I look at the diagnosis. And to me, um, I don't know what's the diagnosis in here at all. <clears throat> so uh, you don't have to make that call by yourself. Um, you can just call the pathologist and ask them what the diagnosis is. So the pathologist, you call the pathologist and the pathologist tells you that the patient, um, uh, the pathology is suggestive of Crohn's disease uh, of the duodenum. Uh, basically. And then now you've established the diagnosis, right? Go back to the earlier slide um, that we've discussed. You don't have to make the call by yourself. You have many people to decide uh, with you. So ideally, the patient should be discussed in a multidisciplinary uh, uh, meeting, and a plan should be formulated from that, from that uh, uh, meeting. Again, um, um, I don't actually care what has been done for the patient. I would establish the roadmap myself. So I know that we've done an upper jaw endoscopy and we know that he has a confirmed diagnosis of a duodenal stretcher, right? Um, I would do a colonoscopy because he, um, uh, the patient presented with, uh, with uh, uh, bleeding and diarrhea. So I need to know if there is any disease elsewhere in their bowel, mainly in their colon and the terminal ileum. And then I would do imaging um, uh, with a CT enterography or MRI enterography. Um, the moment I establish their diagnosis and their roadmap, I know what I'm dealing with. So um, what you can do actually for uh, stretching disease of the, of the uh, uh, genome, is you can dilate them uh, with a balloon um, uh, dilation. And this is what has been done for the patient. Uh, most of the time, um, almost in every single case, the, the balloon dilatation is very uh, successful um, and um, they can go back to normal really, really quick. <clears throat> so the patient did well. Um, he was maintained on Ramicaid uh, for two years. Uh, Ramicaid is in Fleximab and then presented with similar symptoms again. So what do you wanna do next is, again, I keep putting this slide all the time because it's very, very important. You've seen them two years ago. So make sure you have a roadmap again. So you have to do everything again. You have to scope them, a giant endoscopy, lower giant endoscopy, and a CTE. Establish the extent of their disease. And then they had a dilation once, so you can dilate them again um, uh, with upper GI uh, endoscopy. Um, and uh, what I do usually, and the general recommendation is to dilate them twice. And if they come up again, um, you have to operate on them. Again, I keep putting the same slide because just stick to the principles. Um, if you are taking them to the operating room, make sure you've done the roadmap, make sure you've optimized them and go to the operating room. Start with laparoscopy, have a plan A and a plan B. Plan A in this patient is very easy. Plan A is to do a stretchoplasty. Any chemical is stretchoplasty, and I would come and explain this later on. This is your option A. Try to do that all the time. Option B, which we don't like in duodenal disease, is to bypass them with a gastrogenostomy. I would always try to do um, uh, stretchoplasty for the duodenum if I can. If I can for any reason, I would divert them. Uh, sorry, I would bypass them with a gastrogenostomy. <clears throat> uh, dealing with duodenal Crohn's um, is very difficult because, um, um, as you know, the duodenum um, is very close to important structures and you cannot simply resect to denum. <clears throat> if you're lucky, you're gonna be dealing with a stretching disease because stretching disease is very easy to manage. Um, you dilate 
and then you um, um, you stretch your blast in them uh, if you have to. Um, but if you're dealing with penetrating, penetrating disease, um, um, uh, it's a bit uh, troublesome um, because um, you cannot do an endoscopy option. You cannot stretch your blast in them. So you have to bypass them. And the problem with bypassing them is you're gonna make them better, but you're gonna exclude the segment of the small bowel that uh, is um, actively inflamed. Um, they are on medical therapy and they fail. So it's gonna be, um, it's gonna continue to progress and inflame. Um, um, and uh, you cannot survey that segment by endoscopy. And we know bypass surgery in Crohn's patient increase the risk of malignancy. Um, so if you are bypassing them, just establish some sort of method to survey that, uh, that uh, uh, segment of the excluded bowel, usually through imaging. And as a general principle, never whipple them. Um, don't do a whipple. Whipple is a malignant uh, procedure. It's only for, well, I wouldn't say only, but it's mainly for uh, malignant pathology. Even if the gastroenterology tells you to resect the segment, just don't do it. <clears throat> you can stretch for uh, a few seconds and then uh, we're gonna go on. Uh, you can have water. You can have juice if you want. And then we're gonna go to, uh, to uh, kiss two. I just don't like to talk for like a long time. Um, and then, uh, <clears throat> okay, so uh, case two is uh, 34 years old. Uh, this time is a surgical resident, um, known to have Crohn's disease, uh, presented with increasing abdominal pain, vomiting, constipation, and fever. Um, they are on infleximab for five years. Um, their vitals, they are febrile, tachycardic, their pressure is fine, and their sas is fine. Um, they are tender all over the abdomen, uh, but there is no peritonitis. Their white count is elevated, and their albumin is 33. Again, 33 is like normal. So just think about uh, what I said earlier. Um, uh, it could be deceiving. Um, uh, albumin is acute phase reactant, uh, so you can get a free albumin on them. Uh, in fact, I would get free albumin on them. Just think about what you're going to do next. So obviously this patient is sick and um, um, they are also tachycardic but maintaining their pressure. And again, going back to the basics, resist to operate. This patient will not die from Crohn's flare-up. You have all the time in the world to work them up, to manage them. Don't be smart. Don't invent anything, stick to the basics. And again, go back and sit in the back seat and be a back seat driver. Um, so they had um, an abdominal um, X-ray, uh, which basically showed uh, distended small bowel loops, uh, suggestive of uh, distended small bowel obstruction. And of course, these patients uh, would get a CAT scan in any center. And what you can see in the CAT scan, uh, they have uh, distended small bowel uh, loops. And you see this area in here, uh, there is a mesenteric abscess um, in the area causing an obstruction. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, they are um, Crohn's disease. Um, you know, they have an abscess, you know, they have an obstruction. So you have to address these three problems. Again, going back to the basic, basics, let's state this patient. They are sick, give them fluid, start antibiotics early, right? Uh, to manage their sepsis. We have a source for their sepsis, which is the mesenteric abscess. Get a source control, get an IR drain uh, in them as soon as you can. Uh, you can temporize stuff with IR drain almost all the time. They are obstructed, put an NG tube um, and Go back to the basics again. 
I can tell you, uh, as I said earlier, they developed, they've moved from Crohn's inflammation to Crohn's uh, complications. And the moment you're dealing with complications, you need to operate on them. No steroids will help you. No biologic will help you at all. Go back to the basic and establish a roadmap. I keep emphasizing on this because um, very few people does it. Get um, about, well, you don't need an upper GI endoscopy on this patient, but get a colonoscopy, get a CTE, CT enterography, an MRE on them to establish their Crohn's disease anatomy. Uh, this patient uh, is probably malnourished. They are obstructed. You're dealing with abscess. You're dealing with penetrating disease. So they're going to be MPO for a long time. So I would start them on um, uh, PPN um, early. Um, personally, I always um, try to feed patients centrally. But in this case, I would think about starting PPN early on. Don't forget about the DVT. Uh, keep them on DVT prophylaxis all the time. And then you temporize stuff uh, with IR brain, with MPO, with TPN. Most of them they would resolve um, through that acute stage. And then you can present them in an MDC, a multidisciplinary conference, and then come up, up, come up with a plan. <clears throat> um, Whenever I see Crohn's um, abscesses, I know that the patient would be in trouble. Uh, so I always, always uh, communicate with the patient all the time. I would put the worst case scenario and I would start mentioning stomas um, early on um, and um, drains for a long time. So I get them prepared for the, for the worst. Um, I feel when you get them on board early on, um, uh, that avoid future conflicts when you proposed the surgery to them, or when you have an intraoperative decision to make and they wake up with something else than what you told them. <clears throat> um, so uh, 70, sorry, like this is a wide range. So almost a quarter of uh, uh, patients will present with some sort of abscesses in the small uh, bowel. Uh, usually it's at the um, uh, terminal ileum, at the ileocecal junction, most of the time. Um, I can say uh, you can temporize stuff, but majority uh, would require surgery. Almost all of them, they have Crohn's complication, they would require surgery. And whenever you review their imaging, whenever you take them to the operating room, look for associated fistula. 40%, almost half, would have some sort of associated fistula, whether to another loop of the bowel or to another organ in the abdomen. <clears throat> As I said, Percutaneous drainage is always your friend. 90% of the time, you would be successful timberizing them with um, an IR drain. Um, IR drain might lead to formation of an intracutaneous fistula, but you have no choice. They have already formed an internal fistula. And the goal with the IR drain is you want to convert an emergency situation to an elective situation. We all know when you operate on a sick patient in an emergency situation, you have a higher complication rate. You have a higher conversion rate if you actually can do it and start with laparoscopy. You have a high stoma uh, rate, reoperation rate. You would increase their length of stay in the hospital and they would require longer nutritional support. Always remember that in your mind. So try to temporize them and put them into an elective uh, situation. <clears throat> if you have to operate on them emergently, you have no plan B. Um, I told you earlier, thought, think about plan A and plan B. But when you operate on them uh, emergently for an abscess, you have only one plan. Just go in there, proximally divert them with a the stone and come out. There's nothing else you can do. If you resect them, they're going to fail. Um, if you bad, put them back together uh, with anastomosis, that anastomosis would leak. If you try to tackle the abscess, it's an inflammatory hostile area. You're not gonna be able to resect anything. So just proximally divert them. That's your only plan if you're operating on them emergently. Um, again, um, as much as we hate stomas, um, um, there is no plus, there is no minus, there's no equal. Um, well, actually there is an equal. Stoma sometimes is equal life. 
whether you're saving the patient life um, by giving them stoma or you're improving their quality of life by, this, by giving them uh, the proximate diversion. Uh, most of these patients, they don't present uh, like normal patients. They will be struggling for a long time and they would have pain, uh, food intolerance for a long time and they would come um, late to the hospital. Uh, by, diverting, by, by diverting them, you would give them a better quality of life. So um, this patient was doing well, uh, you are doing them, uh, they are eating now, uh, their output is um, uh, minimal, but it's still bilious. So um, you decided to send them home um, with an IR drain. So uh, what now? <clears throat> Before you decide what now, as you have to take a step back and see what happens with the patient. Uh, this patient basically uh, was on medication for five years. So they ba basically failed medical management. Um, and they developed Crohn's complication despite being on biologics. And when we think about uh, failure of medical management, everybody think about complications, but um, uh, uh, failure of medical management has different dimensions. But the main uh, thing is if their symptoms are worsening, just despite being on medication, they've actually failed medical management. If they have increasing pain, obstructive symptoms, um, any other symptoms, they have failed their medical management and you have to operate on them uh, to resect the complicated segment. If they develop steroid dependency um, uh, and you cannot take them off steroids, uh, they fail medical management because nobody can, like at least Crohn's patient, you don't want to put them on long life uh, steroids. So that's the other dimension of um, of uh, failure of medical management. Um, and the last one is if they develop uh, medication allergy or medication toxicity to the biologics, they fail medical management and you have to operate on them. <clears throat> uh, before you operate on any patient, um, and this happens uh, frequently because they go home, they come back, and you don't see them probably for a few weeks or a few months. And I can tell you 100%. Uh, by doing these steps, you would remember something or you would see something new that you did not see or pay attention to. Before you operate on them, extensively review their imaging, um, their CT, uh, their CTE, review the colonoscopy, review their medications. I can't tell you how many times I operated or I've seen patient booked for elective surgery. And when they come to the, op to the, uh, to the operative days, someone started them on steroids. And when you're doing a definitive surgery, you don't want them to be on steroids. Assess their nutrition all the time. Even if you see them like two months ago, three months ago, make sure that they are nutritionally optimized before you operate on them. And again, <clears throat> get the stomachs to see them. Even if you're not doing, um, uh, um, or you're not planning to do a stoma, just mark them, uh, put a stoma mark in them. You never know what you're gonna encounter in the operating room, mark them all the time. <clears throat> so um, uh, the goal in the operating room is not to cure the patient. Crohn's disease is a chronic uh, disease. You cannot cure it. Your goal is to save the bowel, resect only the complicated segment and relieve their symptoms. Start with laparoscopy. And I cautioned you earlier with laparoscopy. If you can't, do it, don't persist. If you know that you're gonna end up making a big incision, um, uh, um, just go and convert right away. Um, assess the extent of the disease um, clinically when, in, when you're in the operating room by looking and also feeling. Look for complications of um, uh, stretchers, complications of uh, uh, fistulas, uh, feel the bowel, feel the mesentery, uh, the most important thing, look at the involvement of other structures, um, um, mainly the bladder, uh, the colon. Sometimes you can have a connection to the colon, connection and a fistula to the bladder. And um, I would just go a step back. When you review their imaging, um, look at these relations too. Because sometimes if you have an extensive inflammation close to the ureter, 
you want to stent them before you take them to the operating room or before you operate on them to identify the ureter intraoperatively. And also be gentle uh, when you're handling the bowel because any tear in the mesentery, I don't know if you've seen Crohn's mesentery before, but I can tell you I have seen the Crohn's mesentery bleed as if you open the cave um, and they lose significant amount of blood. So be really gentle when you're handling the bowel. Any sudden pull or, um, or push can cause a mesenteric tear, which can end up with a massive bleeding. <clears throat> um, look for innocent uh, bystanders, like the bladder, um, another room of bowel, um, the colon. And before you resect, you have already have an imaging roadmap, but have a roadmap in the operating room. See what you're resecting. Um, establish uh, the segment that you're going to take and examine the entire bowel. You don't need any microscopic margin. If the bowel looks okay, it feels okay, that's how far you need to go. And again, as an, I said this many times, you would see in the textbook many different ways of putting Crohn's patients together uh, for anastomosis. Uh, don't invent any method. Don't try any method. Just do whatever you're comfortable with. If you're comfortable with hand sewn anastomosis, just do it. If you're comfortable with a stable anastomosis, just do it. There is no data to support um, any method. Just do whatever you're comfortable with. And most importantly, document their Crohn's anatomy and document the length of the bowel you've resected and how much bowel they have left. Because we know uh, almost half of these patients would come, back, would come back again at some point in their life and you're gonna operate on them. Um, and having an idea how much uh, of a bowel they have, it would help you decide what kind of operation you will do in the future when they have a recurrence. <clears throat> um, so this patient definitely like, um, uh, came back, had an elective operation uh, uh, with primary anastomosis intra-op, they have a short segment of disease which was resected. I wouldn't go into much of the details. They were doing well and uh, they wanna go home possibly seven. Um, and um, <clears throat> the junior resident decided to take the stable south. And this is what happened. And again, this is a common scenario. Um, um, they take the stable out and they have a partial decreases. Always remember these patients are, um, even if you try to optimize them, they are not gonna be a normal individual and they are prone to more complications. Um, so um, uh, always, always do any step with caution. And personally, I wouldn't take the stables. If they are on steroids, I would keep it for two weeks. If they are not um, optimized by any means, um, I would keep it for two weeks. Um, but generally, I, uh, I take them around day 10. The whole message is these patients are prone to more complications than normal individuals. Um, we've talked about this. Um, so uh, the patient uh, was doing well, and then they came in a few weeks later to the hospital complaining about uh, abdominal wall swelling. Um, and um, someone did an ultrasound and there was an uh, uh, abdominal wall collection. Um, it was drained at the bedside uh, in the emergency and they have a large amount of bile coming out of the wound. <clears throat> um, so basically, again, sit back, they are Crohn's patient, um, see uh, what you're dealing with. What you're dealing with with this patient is um, uh, a patient who uh, came in back with an abscess, and when you drain the abscess, uh, you have uh, bile. So basically, what they've developed in the fistula uh, of, uh, of their bowel. Um, uh, Crohn's fistulas can be internal or external. Internal fistulas are inside the abdomen. Most commonly it's an enteroenteric fistula, meaning it's between one loop of the bowel to another loop of the bowel. But Crohn's can fistulize to basically anything in the abdomen, but mainly the bladder and the sigmoid. External fistulas are usually uh, intracutaneous fistulas uh, to the skin, sometimes to the back, sometimes to the thigh, uh, but they are outside their, uh, their abdomen. Um, only fistulas that 
are symptomatic, especially the intro intro enteric fistulas, they require a treat, uh, require treatments. If they are not symptomatic, leave them alone. <clears throat> and fistulas count about uh, 15 to 24 uh, percent of surgeries performed on Crohn's disease. Um, as I said, intro enteric fistulas are the most common. Uh, majority of them uh, originate uh, in the terminal ileum, just like abscesses, and in your sigmoid is actually the most common PI fistula. Um, so the etiology of the fistula determines the best uh, treatment and the success rate. Um, uh, there are two etiologies um, uh, of Crohn's fistulas. One is the uh, boost up fistula, like this patient, and uh, there are two main etiology for the fistula. Uh, uh, one is either a leak, a delayed leak, that fistula is the skin, and the other one is missed introtomy. Uh, missed introtomy is common in, uh, in Crohn's patient, uh, especially in reoperative uh, surgery. Um, they usually present early, but delayed leak present later on. If you have a fistula, related to uh, an estomotic leak, that's actually a good news because um, that's the most common and you're actually dealing with a healthy bowel. So you can try conservative management. Um, NPO, if you have to put an NG on um, and um, um, uh, see what happens um, and also drain the, the, I will come to that later on, but drain the sepsis and do the other, uh, the other steps. Um, if you are dealing with the other type of fistula, which is not post-operative fistula, this fistula usually is related to Crohn's disease, and that's usually a bad news because it's coming from an inflamed uh, segment of the bowel, and you cannot try any conservative management for that patient. In, uh, fistulas in Crohn's patient has a range. They can be a simple fistula, they can be a complicated fistula, and it would come to that into the later state, into the later slides. There is different classifications. Uh, personally, I don't like classifications because um, um, they don't help me much, but fistulas in Crohn's patient are divided in different classification based on the side, output, complexity. Site, uh, small bowel, uh, a colon, stomach, and esophagus. I would say stomach and esophagus fistula are very, very rare. They are classified based on the output, um, um, low, moderate, and high. Um, you would see moderate in some textbook, but in general, they are classified to low and high. Uh, low being less than 500 ml uh, in a day, and high is more than 500. Uh, complexity, it can be simple or complex. Simple fistula is um, uh, it's just one tract, and it's simple. Complex fistula is long, multiple, involve other organs. Um, I would say a simple, long tract fistula, both of fistulas um, are way easier to manage. Um, sorry, um, and low output fistula are way easier to manage than high output. Uh, Crohn's related, related fistulas. <clears throat> this is the range I was talking about. You can see just like a, a small fistula um, that come off uh, skin, whether that, that uh, uh, skin is a wound uh, postoperatively or a normal skin, or you can have something like this. If you have something like this on the left side, uh, that's a hostile abdomen, um, had multiple operations, but they are still leaking bowel. The whole, the whole idea is try to convert them from this picture to this picture. <clears throat> Management of fistula um, is again easy. Stick to the principles. Um, the way I look at it, I manage all fistulas with a snap. Uh, probably uh, some of you have heard about the uh, snap approach, but I would summarize it really, really quick. <clears throat> Um, before we jump into this, uh, to the uh, 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 snap, uh, when you're dealing with a fistula, um, uh, always, always state the patient, make sure they are restated, especially, especially when you are dealing with a high output fistula. Uh, measure the output all the time, see how much they are draining, um, and replace their losses uh, with, uh, with IV fluid. And try to control the output as much as you can. Um, to control their output, 
um, you can keep them NPO um, to see the effect of the uh, NPO on the output. Uh, if um, uh, you want to feed them, you can ask the dietitian uh, to come and help you because there is specific instruction um, that would uh, decrease the output, uh, like small, low meals, um, different concentration of like different uh, nutrients. Um, so just to get the dietitian to see them and help you with the output. Um, give them fiber um, as much as, um, as they can eat. And there is um, different medications you can use to help controlling the output. And basically by controlling the output um, is the whole idea is you're trying to preserve or you're trying to prolong uh, the uh, absorption time, keeping the bowel content into the um, lumen so they would absorb uh, more, more uh, nutrition. Um, uh, but uh, personally, my approach, which I was uh, taught, is um, um, uh, you can start with uh, simple medications and then you can go to heavy duty medication. What I usually do if I'm trying to control output, either for a high output fistula or for an ileostomy, is I put them on um, uh, amodium, lopramide, to start with, and then you can go to the maximum dose, which is 16 milligram. The trick is to give them the ammonium half an hour before their meals and also at night. Um, the night dose usually will control their nocturn nocturnal output, uh, which is very convenient for the patient. And then I would go to other medications. Uh, what I would really do is I add codeine um, um, to their medications to slow the output. And there is no maximum dose for codeine at all. Just make sure they are not operating heavy machines and they are not driving or doing any uh, behavior that require a very high concentration. Um, uh, and um, you can keep, give them codeine um, as much as they are um, uh, awake, basically. When they start like to be sleepy, just um, stop with that, with that dose. Then you can add uh, Lomotil, uh, which is um, a weak narcotic. And then the final one, which all the medical students and residents love, is the uh, uh, octreotide. Um, whether you can give them long acting or short acting. The problem with octreotide is injectable and um, it's usually three doses a day and it's very, very expensive. But that's my algorithm for controlling a high output fistula or high output even ileostomy. Um, the other forgetting part um, is the wound management. Get the stoma nurse to see them. Protect the uh, wound, uh, sorry, protect the uh, skin around the fistula. Um, remember, especially in uh, proximal fistula, uh, the bowel content is uh, acidic and has bile, which is very irritant to the skin. And if you cannot put an appliances, uh, that's a nightmare for the patient and a nightmare for you as a care provider. So protect that skin as much as you can and involve the stoma nurses early on in their care. <clears throat> and then going back to um, uh, SNAP approach. When you're dealing with, uh, uh, with uh, any type of fistula, make sure um, you uh, control the sepsis. Sepsis is the leading uh, cause of mortality in these patients. Um, if they have a superficial abscess, drain it. If they have a deep abscess, um, try to drain it with an IR drain. Most of these patients will be on TPN. So always, always remember that they have a line and they can develop line sepsis too. <clears throat> uh, focus on their nutrition. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, my uh, nutrition and roadmap. And it, it's just helpful when you're dealing with the patient. If you know the level of the fistula, you can actually supply them. Uh, with uh, whatever they are not able to absorb uh, or whatever the fistula is bypassing. Um, and then uh, my uh, go-to uh, feeding method, if I can, is internally, if I can't feed them internally for any reason, uh, but mainly for sepsis management or uh, for output management, I would start them on TPN uh, almost all the time. And again, establish the road, the road map. And the road map in fistula is actually two things. Establishing their Crohn's anatomy we talked about with a scope and imaging, 
and establishing the tract anatomy. Um, and you can establish the tract anatomy either by um, a, a plain uh, sinogram, uh, injecting a contrast into the, into the fistula and see where the fistula is grown. And, uh, or we can do a CT sinogram by injecting a contrast into the uh, fistula and then trace the, the contrast. If you're doing a CT, like any kind of sinogram, make sure they don't get any other intral uh, contrast, uh, like oral or rectal, because that would uh, deceive your images. So establish their Crohn's extent and Crohn's, Crohn's roadmap and establish their uh, fistula roadmap. The fistula roadmap would help you when you go to the operating room. You would know where you're gonna go. <clears throat> and then plan for the procedure. Ideally, the moment they develop complex fistula, um, um, if you deal with their sepsis, deal with their nutrition, wait for at least six months, especially for complex post-operative fistulas. Um, uh, in both of the complex fistulas, like the fistulas I showed you um, uh, earlier, uh, before you operate on them, ensure adhesion maturity. Um, it's a very simple clinical test. Um, um, you just pinch um, the skin. If you can pinch the skin, they established basically a new uh, peritoneum and the adhesions are formed. But if you cannot pinch the skin, as if the skin is actually stuck to a bone, they did not establish uh, adhesion maturity. Uh, so you have to wait. Um, um, as far as I know, post operative complex post fistulas, most of the centers they wait for at least a year before they operate on them. Uh, it's a complex procedure, so make sure you have an all day case uh, booked. And uh, it's nice to have an ICU bed as a backup. <clears throat> Um, go rogue, uh, big incision, um, uh, release all the adhesions. Um, uh, like the common missed adhesions are the lateral adhesions. Uh, make sure you can actually physically take the entire small bowel outside the abdomen and examine the entire uh, small bowel. Avoid any intraotomies as much as you can. And you have, if you have intraotomies, prepare them immediately. Um, don't wait to the end because um, the odd that you're gonna miss one, it's probably higher. At the moment you make an intraotomy, just repair it right away. You're not gonna, you're gonna spend like five minutes, but you're gonna gain much at the end of the procedure. At the end of the procedure, if, especially if it is a long procedure, you're gonna be uh, tired. You just wanna go uh, have a coffee or lunch and um, uh, just do it right away. Don't wait for it. Don't repair the fistula set. That segment has already failed just resect it and do a primary anastomosis. And when you do a resection, preserve as much bowel as you can. If the bowel is not inflamed, just don't take it out. Again, document all the time. Whenever you take a bowel, document whatever you've taken, document what they have left. <clears throat> you can do a proximal diversion um, uh, as required. Uh, personally, I don't divert them unless there's a clear, clear indication divert them. And what you can do is, um, if you're in doubt uh, that you've missed an entrotomy, you can do a CO2 uh, test for entrotomies. I, have, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's a very, very easy, easy test. It's like doing a leak test for anastomosis. You soak the abdomen uh, with, uh, or you fill the abdomen with, uh, with water or saline, and then you attach an NG tube to uh, uh, an insufflation uh, tube for the laparoscopy and see if there is any bubbling. If there is any bubbling, you just like repair it. Um, I know um, a number of colorectal surgeons, uh, they do this test like routinely. I don't personally do it. Uh, and the hardest part in a complex uh, uh, post-operative fistula is abdominal wall reconstruction. So if you have an expert in your center, um, just get them on board and let them reconstruct the abdomen especially if you're dealing with something uh, like uh, the picture I showed you. And that's um, not, not, uh, not uncommon in Crohn's patients. Um, if you follow these steps and you manage the SNAP, um, uh, according to the literature, you have an 80% success um, in getting this patient to safety. <clears throat> um, you can take like a few um, 
seconds break and then we're gonna finish up really quick on some literature and knowledge. Okay, a stretching disease, um, it's very easy, uh, very quick. Uh, so if you are dealing with um, a short stretcher or a multiple stretchers within a short segment of the bowel, just resect it. If there's any concern for significant resection or any concern for a short bowel syndrome development, you can do a stretchoblasty or a combination of uh, resection and stretchoblasty. Uh, contraindications for stretchoblasties are many. But if you have active inflammation, fistulas, phlegmo, and diffuse peritonitis, cancer, tension, or um, 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 you're going to do a stretchoblasty, closed anastomosis, just don't do it. Um, that's a contraindication. Uh, it's going to fail. Uh, multiple uh, method to do a stretchoblasty. Pick up one or two, be comfortable with. For a short stretch of less than um, uh, 10 centimeters, the go to uh, method is uh, any chemicals. Uh, stretchoplasty. Uh, basically, you have the bowel, as you can see here in the picture. Um, cut the bowel longitudinally to cause that to uh, to make an enterotomy, and usually go one centimeter beyond the structure, and then close it transversely. Um, it's very very easy uh, to do for short uh, short stretchers. If you have a long stretchers uh, between uh, ten to uh, twenty centimeter, uh, you can do um, either a fine. Uh, stretchoplasty or a uh, uh, jabulae. Um, uh, Finney is probably easier than the jabulae. It's very, very easy again, as you can see in the, in the picture. Um, um, you just fold the bowel in itself, uh, suture the back wall, and then make an introtomy and suture the front wall. Uh, it should look like this um, uh, at the end. Um, uh, it's not very common to do it. I've probably done one or two um, in my training. And if you have a really long uh, stretcher, more than 20 centimeters, um, you can do a Michelassi stretchoplasty. And it's basically side to side um, anastomosis in isoprostaltic uh, uh, way, um, as you can see in the pictures. Uh, typically, those are not for general surgeons. So um, if you think you're going to deal with um, a stretchoplasty or you're going to do one, just refer the patient to a colorectal surgeon. Um, uh, and then uh, the last thing um, is uh, cancer and dyscasia. Um, it's very rare uh, in small bowel. Um, almost, um, uh, uh, I can't remember I've seen, I've seen one. Um, it's very difficult to diagnose uh, preoperatively. Usually you see it on the final pathology. Um, and very, very few cases are suspected uh, pre-op. Um, um, as I said earlier, uh, just watch the function and bypass uh, bowel. Um, uh, you have an increased risk of developing malignancy. Okay, uh, we're going to go to the MCQs right now. Um, um, I'm going to read them, but you're going to be able to. Uh, um, okay, Dr. Khamed. Uh, now we will have uh, uh, MCQs. You can uh, answer to the people here. Uh, if you don't mind, excuse me, uh, I'm going to read the question. Yeah, sure. Okay, we have, we have a case of 45-year-old man uh, known to have a Crohn's disease maintained on the MSAID, presented with the water diarrhea, uh, with occasional rectal bleeding, CT showed this thickening with ileocecomoid fistula, uh, Colonoscopy showed normal colon. What is the best option for the management? And we have one minute for the question.
Now, ten seconds left. <clears throat> Okay, most of them answered uh, D. Okay, um, so just uh, let's go back to the question and think about it uh, a little bit. Um, okay. so, um, um, so just see what you're dealing with, right? Um, so are you dealing with a Crohn's inflammation or you're dealing with Crohn's complication, right? So um, if you're dealing with Crohn's inflammation, um, medication is usually the go-to answer. If you're dealing with Crohn's complication, uh, which is in this case, so this patient has, has a Crohn's complication. They developed a fistula from their TI to the sigmoid, and they've actually failed medical management. So um, medication will not be the correct answer, right? So they would need resection. And in terms of resection, um, when you're dealing with a fistula, um, and I talked about this a bit in the slide, um, um, you're dealing with a diseased segment and a bystander, and it's an innocent loop of bowel. And that's usually innocent of loop of bowel um, was just got, in, got like caught in the mess, right? Um, so this patient had a normal colonoscopy. They, they don't have inflammation in their colon at all, right? So their colon is normal. Um, uh, so what I would do and what's the recommendation would be is D, is you seek a resection and primary repair of the sigmoid code. Uh, that's the answer. Uh, C is strong because um, um, their, uh, their sigmoid is normal and it would heal if you just close it primarily. Sometimes you can just even divide uh, the fistula with a stapler. Okay, the can wait for the next question if you can read it kindly, please. <clears throat> okay, go ahead, Dr. Hamid. Um, so this patient is, uh, let me just move this a uh, bit if you have, uh, I can see the question like the ball is like in my face. Okay, uh, so a uh, 45 years old man, uh, known to have the eye Crohn's disease, maintained on infliximab, and then went to surveillance CTE, CTE intraography, to assess the treatment response. Uh, CTE showed multiple intro and fistulas between different loop of small bowel. He's ready to take two months vacation uh, to travel around Europe. What is the best management option? A, switch uh, him to another biology. B, watch and wait. C, bowel resection of the involved segment. And, um, uh, sorry, um, bowel resection of the involved segment. And the last one is proximate reversion with a stoma. So now, dear, dear audience, you have one minute for the, to answer the question. Ten seconds left. So the uh, most of them answer B. Uh, kindly, Doctor Hamid, to explain the answer. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, so yeah, the answer, the correct answer is B. And again, um, um, uh, you just look what you're dealing with. Are you dealing with Crohn's inflammation or dealing with dealing with complications, right? So you're dealing with complications.
but the complication is not symptomatic. Like this guy just want to go enjoy his time in Europe. He has no complaint. So don't do anything. Just um, uh, they are uh, what we call them non-functional fistulas. Uh, they are not causing diarrhea or symptoms uh, like the previous patient, right? So just don't do anything. Um, and I can tell you in a surgical question, in a surgical exam, um, uh, like as a general rule, it's not always valid. Um, don't start patients on, like especially IBD patients, they don't want you to start their medication. They don't want you to switch their medication. They want you to do two things. You either leave them alone, don't operate or operate. So um, you can just like um, uh, uh, take out like, you know, uh, switching uh, medication or adding steroids or anything right away when you see most of the time when you see a surgical question. All right, um, that's it uh, for uh, today. Uh, thank you so much. If you have any questions, I'll be happy uh, to answer them. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for this uh, informative uh, lecture. Um, we have a couple of questions. If you don't mind to answer it. Okay, um, so the first question is, please, any clear guidelines for best treatment for flare-ups and for remission that we can follow? Um, um, I can tell you as a general surgeon or as a surgical resident, you actually don't need to know uh, the, um, uh, the uh, best management uh, guidelines uh, for flare-ups and remission. This is usually the gastroenterology uh, arena and just let them manage that. Um, if you want to have an idea um, about, um, uh, you know, when to start medication and stuff, um, I think the American College of Gastroenterology and the European uh, Society of Gastroenterology, they have guidelines of managing patients. Um, the next question is, why short antibiotics given to treat sepsis? Um, I don't really understand uh, the meaning of short antibiotics, uh, but if I'm treating sepsis, in uh, Crohn's patient, I would just give them broad spectrum antibiotics. I wouldn't give them short antibiotics um, at all. Um, and then I would give them antibiotics till their um, sepsis is res resolved. If I'm in doubt, I can re-image them and assess them uh, with re-imaging clinically and with their labs and see if they are responding to, me, to, to my management. Um, uh, if they are like quite self normalizing uh, white count is like uh, improving and the repeat imaging uh, is fine. I would stop their antibiotics. Uh, TI mean, uh, no, TI is terminal ileum. Sorry, that was my bad. Terminal ileum disease. If you have more question. Yeah, we have one more question. <clears throat> Um, so that's a really good question. Um, basically, um, um, uh, uh, what the question is asking is, uh, do you operate on complications all the time? No, I don't. I operate on complications if they are symptomatic, and that's what would guide my management. So if they are symptomatic, uh, if they have worsening symptoms, I would operate on them. If their complication is not symptomatic, I would leave them alone. Even if you see like a hundred million stretch in their, uh, in their CTE, but they are eating, they are having bowel movement, they are not obstructed, I would leave them alone. Okay, we uh, have a question. Yes, from um, So um, that like the focus of the lecture is uh, small bowel Crohn's, but I would be happy uh, to answer the question. Uh, the best option for symptomatic hemorrhoid or anal fissure. Um, so as a general rule, um, in Crohn's patient, if they have perianal disease, don't touch the anus at all. Only if they have sepsis, drain the, the sepsis. If they have uh, hemorrhoid, if they have fissures, if they have uh, anything, 
in their perineum, in their perianal area, try not to touch it at all. Um, just drain the sepsis, put them on biologics, and they would uh, most of the time improve on biologics. Um, um, symptomatic hemorrhoid, um, uh, treat conservatively, deal with emergencies. If they have a thrombosed hemorrhoid, if they have strangulated hemorrhoids, uh, you have no choice. Otherwise, just leave them alone. Um, anal fistulas, um, if there is associated sepsis, uh, drain the sepsis with ceton and put them on biologic um, um, and assess. Uh, if their symptoms are improving, uh, you can decide to take the ceton at some point and see what happens. 50% of the uh, of the fistulas would heal uh, with the cetone and biologics only um, and if they don't heal on uh, biologics you can add another biologic you can switch them and see what happens uh, but um, i can tell you if they don't heal they are in a big trouble um, a good chunk of them would end up with a diversion and even an apr a pluminal perineal resection uh, for their uh, perineal disease I hope that answered the question. Uh, I think we are done with the question. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, we are done. Uh, thank you, Dr. Humed, uh, for uh, this informative lecture. It has been a pleasure to have you today. And uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for attending this uh, lecture. Um, um, thank you so much, uh, Abdul Aziz. It has been a, a pleasure uh, too. Um, I would say uh, we're all in a difficult time right now, um, uh, dealing with like COVID and stuff. Uh, everybody, please stay safe um, and look for yourself uh, all the time. Uh, enjoy your training. It's the best time of your life. Yeah, we all hope and uh, we are trying to do our best. Thank you again, Dr. Hamid. Thank you. Uh, the audience, as you can see here uh, uh, on the screen, you can uh, scan the code uh, to register to our next uh, session, or you can find the links in the Q&A. Uh, the, the, uh, the last session of the ABCC search will be on uh, 22nd uh, uh, of July. Uh, with uh, Dr. Sarah Bihia. Uh, we will resuming uh, the surgical fix series on the next uh, Sunday. Uh, here is uh, the code. Uh, on, uh, on, 17, on 17 July, uh, we will have a uh, plastic surgery foundation course with Dr. Uh, Fadl. Uh, can we will have it uh, for a few seconds to, to scan it. Uh, again, thank you everyone for attending uh, for uh, our today's session. See you next week, inshallah.